Uh, I'm coming from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but I'm also affiliated with, uh, with Bioengineering, Institute of uh, Genomic Biology, and I have uh, multiple collaborators across many different departments. Um, the outline of my talk today, as I mentioned, is to give first uh, uh, background and motivation for quantitative phase imaging for some of you that uh, maybe are less familiar with the field. Uh, then I wanted to talk just a few minutes about SLIM, which is uh, uh, somewhat of a more established technique or older technique developed uh, uh, and commercialized by Phi Optics. And then I'm going to focus on GLIM with uh, several different applications from organoids um, to engineer tissue. And then I have some uh, <clears throat> other applications that I group together at the end. If we have time, I want you to show some, I want, I want to show you some uh, uh, what I believe are very exciting results on combining artificial intelligence with label free imaging. So let me start with the background. Uh, most of my uh, most of my presentation starts with this slide because they it makes the point of uh, uh, floor, the shortcomings that fluorescence brings to the table. So as you know, fluorescence microscopy has been probably the most important tool in cell biology. And I assume will continue to be that. Uh, but as you can tell here, uh, there are some shortcomings. And in particular, there is phototoxicity associated with these dyes uh, uh, and with, with the excitation light especially. And here you see that actually after a while, these cells become unhappy and essentially they die after a short period of time, just because mainly because of the UV excitation. Here you look at two channels of fluorescence. Uh, Photobleaching also is a, another issue, which means that the fluorescence at some point uh, basically is quenched, uh, irreversibly quenched. That means it narrows down the interval of time uh, for which you can investigate the cells. So the solution uh, with quantitative phase imaging is to provide the label-free intrinsic contrast of the structure. So you're looking here at the portion of a neural network where, of course, because we don't use any fluorophores, this is, first of all, non-destructive, so you can image over many days, if you like. And also, there is no photobleaching, obviously, because this, what you're looking at here is a density, an intrinsic dry mass density uh, of, uh, of the cellular structure. In addition to that, you notice that there are colors here, and this is where the quantitative aspect kicks in. And where you see more red, essentially, the cells are more dense, as you know, the density is related to the refractive index of the cell, and this is what is picked up by the phase part of the imaging. So with quantitative information from this type of imaging, we can do cell growth, study intracellular traffic, for example, we can do tomography, uh, even cancer diagnosis that I'm not gonna have time to tell you about, but all these things can be done in a kind of completely new and uh, objective way using quantitative information. So uh, I think, this field, I believe strongly that this field is going to continue to make an impact and is going to be broadly adopted in the uh, biology and medical fields. And that's why I devoted some time to put this book together, the first book on the QPI field, which recently got translated in Mandarin in 2017. Uh, I'm not showing you this to sell books. If you're interested, I'll be happy to give you a PDF of this. I don't have a PDF of the, uh, the one in Chinese, but uh, I'm sure you can find it in libraries. This is not a technical talk, but I thought I will give you uh, just a, a quick classification of the different geometries that you can have, uh, that you can use to produce QPI. One is uh, phase shifting. In this case, you have an image produced by a microscope, let's say, or an, any imaging system. The reference field with which you do interference is actually parallel to the imaging field. In this case, you modulate the delay of the reference with respect to the image one, you collect usually four frames, you combine them, and you get a beautiful image like this, which is quantitative, as you can tell from the color bar. The off-axis method uh, uses a reference that is tilted at an angle, hence the name off-axis. And now the information is captured in these fringes that are uh, structured along one, di one direction. The advantage of this is that it's single shot. You can have one phase map out of one uh, intensity image. The disadvantage of it is actually the sensitivity is much lower than here, meaning 
because this, the processing is in the spatial domain, I don't want to get into all the details, but because all the processing is done in the spatial domain and your image is actually obviously in the spatial domain, you tend to add noise due to numerical processing and other reasons. So long story short, the cleanest, highest sensitivity you can get is through phase shifting, but obviously you cannot go too fast. And I'm going to come back to uh, to this compromise in a second. I just wanted to point out that Fire Optics is commercializing an off-axis method, which is called DPM, uh, with white light. So this is our low-cost uh, uh, device that uh, is available, uh, but again, for uh, which works very fast. But uh, for higher sensitivity measurements. Um, uh, my recommendation would be to use one of these, either SLIM or uh, GLIM. SLIM is a phase shifting method, as I mentioned, and is built around an existing phase contrast microscope. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, how phase contrast works. Uh, again, without getting into the details, uh, essentially what we do is to create that ring in the back focal plane of the objective, which is right here in the pupil plane. Um, there is a ring in the, the Zernike phase contrast, the regular phase contrast microscope, there is a ring that shifts the incident light in phase by a quarter wavelength with respect to the scattered light. What we did was to make this ring tunable. So we projected this pupil plane precisely onto a liquid crystal phase modulator, an SLM, and we matched that ring to the mask on the SLM. So without modulation here, through this beam splitter, we obtained the regular phase contrast image, which is this. But the moment we add Pi over two modulation on that ring, we get another image, and then pi over two more, another image, and another image. We combine these four intensity images, and now we get a beautiful quantitative phase map, which is very, very uh, sensitive in the sense that, because first of all, because of the white light, you have no uh, speckles, so you see very fine details of, of subcellular structures. In this case, obviously, you look at the neuron, this is a nucleolus. These are the dendrites that are very fine sub-micron structures. And it's also very stable in time. This is another uh, sensitive point for phase imaging because uh, phase is a very, very delicate, very sensitive to vibrations and so on. In this case, the interfering beams are the one that is focused on the ring and the, the field that is not focused, that, that is basically distributed on this plane. So they are very, very close to one another, and therefore they see the, about the same noise, which gets canceled when we overlap them at the detector. Okay, so if you have more technical questions about this, I'm happy to talk more about it, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. So this is how the commercial instrument, SLIM instrument comes from Fire Optics. Uh, uh, it's a very nice, compact uh, little module that adapts to your existing microscope, whatever the brand might be. and Notice super high sensitivity, super high stability. The speed is limited to something like 12 to 15 frames a second because of the liquid crystal modulator. But lucky for us, there are very few things that move faster than this in a cell, unless you look at membrane fluctuations or action potentials or things like, things like this. This is actually uh, plenty for, at least for what we do in our lab and what our collaborators are doing. Another interesting point and valuable point I wanna make here is that uh, because you, you add, you can add the SLIM module to an existing microscope, uh, you already have all the accessories that allows for temperature control, humidity control, you can add perfusion chambers, what, whatever you have, it will work uh, kind of seamlessly and it will integrate with fluorescence. So on the same optical path, you can get fluorescence and actually alternate between the two. And the software, which is uh, called Selvista, this is a Fire Optics Selvista software suite, um, it does all this processing, all this shifting, uh, the user doesn't even see it, everything uh, is processed in real time, some of it goes onto the GPU, some of it on CPU, and what you see is actually real-time slim image, uh, and it works as you scan the stage, the image moves with it, it's all uh, real time, and programmable, you can scan very large fields of view, multiple well plates, and so on. For example, here, this is a an old movie, but still to, I like it. Uh, it's a mesh actually, I think, of about five by five fields of view. Uh, you can't even tell where they were stitched just because the background is almost perfect. And these cells, what's interesting here compared to fluorescence, these cells are actually developing over about five days or so. So notice there is no 
uh, cell death that is visible. Uh, the cells are happy, viable, they're multiplying, they grow. And that is one huge benefit with the label-free imaging. Uh, of course, sometimes we are interested to go deep into subcellular structures and study dynamics of single cells or even organelles and uh, kind of sub portions of the cell. You can see here that you can do that. By the way, this is just the 40X objective. Uh, you can go even higher if you like. So what you notice there was the chromatin showing very high refractive index here. Uh, so again, these cells have no labels at all. These have never been labeled with anything. This is just the face map that uh, shows the refractive index quantitatively. A quick point about uh, switching back and forth with fluoresces. This is how actually you can do it. In this particular case, on the same field of view, we're looking at uh, fluorescent mitochondria. So this is GFP expressed in mitochondria. And by going back and forth, you can actually, if you're interested, you can create a mask from the fluorescence and then go back. And then you start to see that actually we are sensitive to single mitochondria in the slim channel. And you can actually detect them and potentially you can start the, the transport uh, with high specificity. This movie also makes the point about photo bleaching. You notice after a while the fluorescence goes away and there isn't much you can do about it. This is another old movie, but uh, it makes the point about the Q, the quantitative uh, in the QPI title. What you can do with this is to convert this phase image, this color map into growth, into density, dry mass density, and then into growth. You look at the E. coli cell that divides and you plot the mass at this, this cell divides into the two daughter cells and you can do this non-invasively for many, many cycles. As you know, this is very, difficult to image actually, they are about a micron in diameter, maybe two to three microns long. Uh, sensitivity is very high in terms of uh, dry mass. There is no balance in the world that will measure femtograms as far as I know. So this is probably the highest sensitivity uh, to dry mass or to cell growth that you can have. One last point about how sensitive slim is, you're looking at single microtubules on a piece of glass. These are 24 nanometer diameter structures that are actually visibly uh, with high contrast shown in slim. And if you do some averaging in the time domain, you can even increase the signal to noise further. But this is something that you cannot easily see with any of the phase contrast or DIC or regular methods. Notice the technique uh, used uh, generally for microtubules is fluorescence and for continuous imaging of two or three minutes, actually the fluorescence goes away again through photo bleaching. So uh, in this paper, we showed how we can image the transport of these microtubules over many hours, which is something uh, impossible to do with other techniques. Finally, this is something unpublished. We're able to measure how oligodendrocytes, these are particular types of cells in the brain that actually are responsible for the myelinization of the axons in neurons. So this is an oligodendrocyte that actually is wrapping around an axon and starts to deposit myelin. As you know, myelin is like the isolating layer that allows the, the axon to communicate electrically. And at the end of this uh, myelin deposition, which takes uh, many days actually, you end up with a 20 nanometer layer of mostly fat around that axon. So what I'm showing you here is probably unprecedented measurements of looking, measuring that deposit of myelin that grows with a few nanometers per day. And again, this is, this is just to point how sensitive slim can be to very, uh, very small nanoscale type of structure. Okay, moving back to cellular, cellular scale imaging, uh, because we use wide light with high numerical aperture, there is an intrinsic sectioning effect that happens in SLIM. So just scanning a cell through focus, you get this kind of an image. There is some blurring in the Z direction, obviously, that's our PSF. But we figured out uh, how to solve that, uh, how to undo this blurring in the, uh, in the reconstruction. So here's a tomogram that actually uh, is obtained just again, just by scanning through focus and applying this reconstruction algorithm, which is basically a 3D deconvolution at the end of the day. So you look at two neurons stuck together here. Again, these have never been labeled. Uh, they start, start to look like a confocal image, except they are live and happy. They've never been fixed or tagged. So now we're looking at the, at the sample, which is 
uh, much more difficult. This is because a collaborator a few years ago came with a, a very excited reading about our slim, came with embryos. These are bovine embryos uh, that he brought us on a dish. And he said, uh, if we could do this with label three with your slim, we'll be so happy to study viability for in vitro fertilization in cattle, which is, I don't know if you know this, but this is a huge, huge business uh, in all the Western countries. Whoops. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what happened was that uh, when we placed these embryos under our slim microscope, uh, because they are ten times at least an order of magnitude thicker than our single layer that we we're used to, the multiple scattering essentially what it does it attenuates the incident light. Uh, exponentially. So it attenuates it so much that we end up with an interference between the incident light, which is plays the role of our reference of the interferometer. The, this reference light is so low and interferes with very strong scatter light, which is the other beam in our interference. So of course, when you mix two highly unbalanced uh, beams in power, you get very low contrast in interference, which translates into very low contrast in our image. So once we understood this, of course, we were disappointed first, but then we understood and we also found a plan of attack, how to fix this problem, how to make it better. And this is basically how Gleam uh, was born, out of this necessity to get high contrast interference through thick samples. So the idea is to find an interferometer in which the two interfering beams are equal in power. So even though they are attenuated exponentially through multiple scattering, they will be attenuated at the same rate. So they will be equal in power and when, the, we, when they overlap, when they interfere, they will still interfere with high contrast. And of course, for those of you familiar, differential interference contrast does exactly this. So the, the old classical DIC from the 1950s uh, has a beam, an image that interferes with itself, with a replica of itself, slightly shifted, but otherwise identical in power. So basically, Gleam is a module that does for DIC what SLIM does for phase contrast. So this module actually controls the phase between one image and the slightly shifted one. Shifted one. And with no, uh, with no phase shift on the SLM again, you get the regular DIC. But once you add pi over two more and pi over two more, you create independent intensity images that again can be combined and gives to give us a quantitative gradient which can be integrated and become a quantitative phase map. Okay, so this is the principle of it, and this is how actually it works. This was the slim image. Okay. Uh, my PowerPoint seems to be overwhelmed a little bit. I'm not sure what the problem is. Can you still see my screen? So this was the original Slim movie, so I assume you can see my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, we can see this guy, bro. Great, so I, I'm out of the presentation mode and it seems to work better. So this is the original Slim movie where you see very low contrast of an embryo. And this is what Gleam can do now. Just by, just by understanding this idea that the two interfering beams have to be as close in power as possible. We managed to create this module that augments the DIC. And essentially what it does, it removes a lot of the multiple scattering background that comes out of this very thick structure. So by the way, here, I hope you can see that there are these little dots inside individual cells. These are individual cells in the embryo. Those are lipid droplets, very highly scattering because they have very high refractive index. And of course, from here, we can go and render a tomogram uh, like this, which allows you to count the cells, measure them, which can be wrapped into a, a kind of a viability uh, marker, if you like, which is entirely uh, intrinsic. So the Phi Optics Glim module looks like this. Uh, you notice, because we don't need to pattern the SLM, actually, uh, the module can be uh, much more compact. 
and the software runs exactly the same and the idea again is the same i think it's very important that these modules fit onto your existing microscopes whatever they might be because i'm sure the users are used to their accessories and uh, kind of the maneuverability of everything uh, and as i said this could be made much uh, much smaller but still fits any uh, major brand of microscopes recently we uh, made the glim system in reflection so this allows you now to look at very bulky tissue where you only have access from one side and this was published uh, more recently the idea is the same in a way if you have a microscope with an output port that generates an image the glim module doesn't care whether where that image was generated in reflection or transmission as long as it's dic the module takes that dic and converts it into glim uh, no matter how the image was formed so now i have a few uh, examples from my lab but also from a number of collaborators so uh, everybody's very very excited especially in the spheroid organoid field uh, to use GLIM to be able to look at the viability of the organoid without fixing it and tagging it with fluorescence which is the regular way of doing it so you've been looking at the uh, 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 liver cancer model this is a colon cancer model you can render it in 3d but again what is interesting is to look in the center of this thing and see how it responds to treatment for example or see how the cells develop and whether they are happy or they're dying and so on a very interesting oops on the previous one a very interesting application here our collaborators at cincinnati actually are our customers they already uh, have this installed in their lab they're interested to look at the effects of radiation and from the very first time they were blown away that you can actually look with intrinsic contrast and see the effect of radiation on the tissue on their uh, lymphoma spheroids which is uh, uh, which is actually very exciting for them uh, this is a kidney organoid from harvard uh, they used it again they're very excited to see this cellular and subcellular structures this is a z stack obviously uh, and you see all these particular structures to uh, that are specific to the kidney um, this is an embroid body uh, from UCLA. Again, the idea is to, to be able to identify single cells and potentially subcellular structures, study their dynamics and so on. Um, so, okay, that movie showed for a little bit, but then it stopped. Uh, let me see if I can do this again. So our collaborators here in Urbana are, are interested in a, uh, Yeah, in a, a hepatocellular carcinoma. These are models, again, for liver cancer. And they're in chemical engineering. So they are half engineers, half biologists, kind of. And basically, they grew these uh, uh, organoids or spheroids on substrates of different mechanical properties. So you, this is a much steeper substrate than this one. So look what happened. On, by the way, here you notice how actually this spreads. The, the, the spheroid starts to spread. Okay. All right, doesn't want to go too much. But on the soft tissue, it's mostly... Okay, I, I'm afraid to break it completely, so I'll leave it at this. So basically, with the stiff substrate, you can see that actually the, the tumor essentially is invading, so it's spreading. While with the soft tissue, it's actually growing, so the cells are proliferating higher, so they're multiplying, but they're occupying basically the same kind of footprint. Uh, in model, uh, model organisms, uh, there is a lot of interesting applications here too. Look at the C elegans, scan through tomographically, uh, again with label free. Uh, our collaborators and, and the customers are really uh, blown away of the level of details that they can get. Uh, again, their traditional way of doing this is to, to tag it with fluorescence. Uh, here we show that actually we can mark particular neurons. I have a colleague here who, uh, whose entire career is focused on, uh, I think, six neurons in the C. elegans, and these are two of them. They are responsible for the adaptation of the C. elegans. And we show that actually we can mark the neuron uh, and overlay it perfectly with the glim. And in, in fact, we can track them if we, if we prefer. Uh, this is another organism, I think, from Germany, from Max Planck. This is a reconstruction. They're interested to look at these. They call them teeth, I think. 
Uh, so they were very excited to see the details of this kind of at the, the edge of this worm. I don't know much about it, to be honest. Uh, but they also they were very happy with the, the details that they could get in here. Uh, okay. My PowerPoint is uh, really... Okay. All right. So this is another rendering. Uh, from the same organism. So notice all these details here and the, the reconstruction uh, following the, the GLIM imaging. Uh, we have some, uh, we had some interesting zebra fish movies that, uh, okay. All right, so I think PowerPoint is suffering from some memory issues, I'm not sure. So these are zebra fish from Harvard that we imaged. And this is a 3D rendering of this. Uh, organism. This this was really impossible for us and for anybody else to image with uh, uh, with regular face contrast or or slim for that matter, as I showed you earlier. Uh, this is a heartbeat in zebra fish, for example, and also the liver is visible. And um, this is from from Brigham and Woman in uh, Boston. Uh, this is an overlay with fluorescence. Uh, which is uh, sometimes necessary. Uh, so this is a gleam image and this is a uh, overlay with the fluorescence that it helps gain that specificity um, uh, whenever needed. Brain slices are also something uh, very exciting for many people, including our lab. You look at the cross section of an entire mouse brain. So this is about a centimeter square, but we scanned it with sub micron resolution. So you see, we stitched them all together. And now if you focus in, you start to see nuclear uh, uh, bodies. And this is a live brain slice. So as you know, these are accepted models for brain functionality for the animal connectivity, at least for a couple of hours. And in that case, you could see the dynamics actually pretty, uh, pretty well as well in a live uh, brain slice. Okay, this is, seems to be too much for the PowerPoint again. So this is another brain slice from, uh, from the Allen Institute. Okay, so let's see if we can get it to run. Okay, so you see the Z scan. Uh, at some point you, you see different layers of cells and you can actually see individual cells and sometimes cellular structures and they can be selected, segmented, counted uh, one can uh, measure dry mass of individual cells. And of course, in this case, it's a fixed slice, but in principle, you can do this dynamically and uh, study various dynamic processes. So we put a GLIM system with our collaborators here in Urbana on top of an electrophysiology system. And this is, uh, uh, this is something similar, it's not from that experiment, but uh, in principle, you can combine these neuroscience tools with the label for imaging and uh, I think you can measure new things. So in this particular case, uh, you can identify a single neuron that otherwise has to be uh, dyed. Uh, you can see it very clearly in our GLIM image as you could, could, could tell from that uh, scan. There are a couple more examples of engineered tissue. Uh, so you can see this is a whole range of various applications, but I'm, uh, I'm excited about all of them, especially those that we don't do. I, I like to see when other people use GLIM and get excellent results. So here uh, you can actually see the sarcomeres in an engineer heart tissue. So this is uh, for tissue engineers, this is actually a great tool now to use this label free image to scan through these th thick cellular systems uh, and actually see very clearly sarcomere. You can quantify it and potentially image it dynamically uh, and see how it responds to the various treatments or things like that. Uh, there is now there is a, a kind of a mixture of different applications. So various customers are using it for different things. For example, in the previous uh, movie, uh, okay, this is dental plaque. So you can actually see, let me get out of the presentation mode again. You can actually see these bacteria that are uh, usually tagged, as you can see with fluorescence. You can actually see them in our GLIM very clearly as you scan through uh, different layers. Uh, we even got a 
botanists or maybe, I don't know, agriculture engineers uh, interested in this. Uh, this is a beautiful movie. I'll be sad if it doesn't work. Uh, okay. Well, let's see if this one works. Hmm. Okay, so I think uh, uh, probably it's a memory issue. I'm not sure, even though we tested this before. Uh, anyway, even without scanning, we can actually tell the uh, high contrast imaging of individual cell layers uh, in these seeds. These are actually plant seeds. Uh, so highly scattering, very difficult to image with anything else. Normally they are sliced into thin slices and then imaged. Uh, and uh, in this case, again, from Max Planck, they were very happy to, to see this uh, high contrast. Uh, okay, I hope PowerPoint doesn't die completely. Okay, this is just a still image uh, with IPS cells, uh, colony development, again, from Allen Institute. This is not a movie. Uh, again, this is scanning through uh, many layers of cells and performing potentially quantitative analysis on individual cells. So I plan to show for the, for the last maybe five minutes, something that is uh, new and that uh, Stephen encouraged me to show, which is phase imaging with computational specificity. This is something very new and exciting in my opinion. The idea is this, how can we use artificial intelligence, use fluorescence at, as ground truth to tag particular structures of interest? and then train AI to recognize those structures with high specificity directly from the label free imaging, slim or glim. So because our imaging systems are automatic we can high throughput, we can image multi-well plates with ease. We can switch between glim and fluorescence also very easily. And the ground truth is basically generated automatically. There is no need for, auto, for manual segmentation or things like, things like this, which is the, usually the bottleneck in uh, most of AI applications. Okay. I wanted to show this movie to see how the data works, uh, data acquisition works. Uh, if I can get out of the presentation mode again. So, Okay, let's see. I guess not. Well, basically what you would have seen is that uh, you can go scan with Glim and then scan with fluorescence, in this case DAPI, so tagging the nuclei, collect that fluorescence data automatically and generate ground truth. And then you feed this into a neural network. Uh, and essentially it, it learns from, uh, it learns the, the, the position of the nucleus directly from GLIM. So this is basically the actual fluorescence, that the DAPI that shows the nucleus. This is DII, which shows the cytoplasm of the cell. And this is our input data, the GLIM. And this is using a unit optimized for this particular problem. This is the inference. This is the synthetic fluorescence that the, the AI generates. And this is the overlay of three of them. Notice that you can multiplex any number of fluorescence channels, provided you have the ground truth, then you can add a dozen of these and they'll be just generated through computation, through GPU uh, and not through actual dyes. So this is the hardware DAPI. This is the actual fluorescence tag. And then this is the digital overlay between GLIM and the AI, the PIX. This is all computational now. If you're a user and I didn't tell you, probably you couldn't tell that this is actually not real fluorescence, but synthetic one. So this is synthetic fluorescence that marks the nucleus. And also we made it, I think for the first time, we made the AI inference to track the stage to actually do that inference in real time. The same thing in Glim, the same story here. So this is peaks. Phased imaging with computational specificity. This is computationally done. And you notice it tracks the cells in real time as you move the stage. So as far as the user is concerned, 
you cannot tell the difference basically. And this is the final point of this. This is a glim on two different kinds of cells. And this is the inference. These cells have never been tagged with anything. But because the network was trained a priori, now you see the nuclei and the cytoplasm very clearly uh, with very high accuracy, even uh, given the fact that we have two different kinds of cells, actually some small, some big, these are two different kinds of breast cancer cells. So it works extremely well. And then you can go back from those synthetic fluorescence map, maps and then compute back into the phase map dry mass of nucleus of cytoplasm or the total one. In this particular case, we looked at how confluency of the cells actually limits the growth, which is a well-known effect. Now this is unpublished. We're working on this uh, peaks. So again, AI combined with QPI to have a label free live dead assay. So if you wanna do a live dead assay, you need to buy these fluorescent kits. And as you know, you have to do it very quickly because the fluorescence is gonna kill all your cells. So there are two channels of fluorescence that you can use for live and dead. We did this with actual fluorescence and then without the fluorescence here, this is basically what you get. So these cells are injured in, the, in light blue here and become dead after a while. We wanted, we wanted them to die just to have this spread. So this is all inferred computationally. So basically what we're showing here, I think for the first time again, is that you can use label-free image that doesn't affect your cell on unlabeled cells and actually decide which one is live, which one is not. And we showed as a preview that in Gleam, you can go back to organoids, organoids and you can use DAPI, and here where the, here's where the nuclei are, but then you can use the computational specificity, use the AI, you actually predict with pretty high accuracy, even though this is highly scattered. So this could be a game changer for doing live dead assay, especially in organoids. It's very important, especially if you're trying to, to understand the killing assay or study some kind of treatment uh, or for tissue engineering, uh, so the accuracy in terms of mass of these nuclei, it's about 4%. That's what we got using the computational map. Finally, this is the last thing I wanted to show you. This is really exciting and I think timely. We were wondering, given that we're able to image single microtubules with SLIM, label free, those are 24 nanometers. Can we image single viruses, in particular uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID virus, and this is how the images look like. The small dots are individual viruses. The bigger ones are clumps of viruses. And here you can actually see individual particles. The bigger ones probably are clump. And notice that you can see these spikes that mimic the spikes on the coronavirus. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. So basically we fed this into AI now. We had the fluorescence control so the viruses were controlled here with fluorescence, were tagged with fluorescence. And actually the correspondence is almost 100%. But we went further and now we image four different kinds of viruses. So they are all in about the same uh, scale, about between 100, 150 nanometers, maybe 200 sometimes. Um, so adenovirus, in this case, we have two particles as you can tell from, tell from these renderings. We use the convolution to help with the resolution a little bit. That's what the D stands for here. This is the convolved slim. This is the COVID. And you notice when you render it, you get these spikes. Of course, these are very thin spikes. You don't expect to resolve them like a TEM, but it's very clear that the structure is different, less smooth than here. Uh, it's interesting, influenza A looks also kind of qualitatively different. And Zika is the smoothest of them all. If you look on, uh, on Google on their actual structure, you can see why. But then we got ambitious and we said, what if we mix all these images of various viruses? We have the ground truth. We mix them essentially digitally. And then with the AI, we were able to tell them apart, all of them with 90% accuracy. So, I think this, is, this speaks for the sensitivity of SLIM and potentially uh, we'd like to, to test this into the clinic and we think it could be a new test that 
may cost, I don't know, 50 cents and can be done in one minute or two instead of the many hours that we have to do now. So look at the ROC curves for these four different kinds of viruses. The accuracy is well above 90% for all of them. So in particular, if we can tell influenza from Corona, I think that that is a big deal, especially in this coming season. Uh, so we have our fingers crossed for this uh, proposal that we just submitted uh, on a fast track. So we'll see what happens. So this is all I plan to show you for now. And I look forward to a question. So in, in summary, um, Glim is, a, I think, a valuable tool uh, for uh, some applications that were impossible for label fee before, including embryos, uh, organoids, animal models, brain slices, and so on. But I wanted to show that SLIM for extreme sensitivity, probably SLIM is the way to go if your sample is thin. A whole uh, range of applications in pathology, if anybody's interested, I can tell you more offline about that. And I wanted to point out that there is an off-axis system that is also available by FireOptics, uh, which is our low-cost entry. It does QPI, it runs fast. The sensitivity is not as good as slim. You'll never measure viruses or microtubules with that. But it may do the job for cell imaging uh, growth and so on. Finally, PIX is a, 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 a new combination with QPI and AI that basically eliminates the need for fluorescence for at least a number of applications while maintaining specificity, which is very, very important for deep biological studies. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions.